Good evening. My name is Tom DeBlack, and I want to welcome you to this session of the Six Bridges Book Festival. Tonight's session is sponsored in part by the Central Arkansas Library System's Adult Programming Division. And we're honored to have with us this evening Ty Sigley. Ty is a visiting professor of history at Hamilton College and professor emeritus of history at West Point. He served in the U.S. Army for 36 years, retiring as a brigadier general. Ty served as the vice chair for the Congressional Naming Commission, tasked to rename Department of Defense assets that honor Confederates. His latest book is Robert E. Lee and Me, A Southerner's Reckoning with the Myth of the Lost Cause. NPR, Forbes, and other news outlets named it one of the best books of 2021. A leader in digital history, Ty is the creator and senior editor of the award-winning West Point History of Warfare, the largest enhanced digital book in any field. He's the author of six other books on military history, three of which won distinguished writing prizes. And during his long army career, he served in armor and cavalry units in peace and war in the United States, the Balkans, Germany, Italy, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Kenya. Uh, we're going to start this evening with, and Ty's going to read a brief selection from this book. Ty, we'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Tom, it's great to be here. It's great to be at Six Bridges. And thank you so much for the kind uh, introduction. And uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. So I am going to read just uh, a couple paragraphs here, and I'll start out with this. Uh, Much of my life led me to glorify Robert E. Lee and Confederate soldiers. My first book, my first movie, my hometown, my college, even the U.S. Army in West Point honored Lee and his cause. I hope this book exposes the lies I grew up believing and why it took so long for me to see the evidence, the facts that I now see so clearly. 11 Southern states seceded to protect and expand an African-American slave labor system. Unwilling to accept the results of a fair democratic election, they illegally seized U.S. territory violently. Together, they formed a new confederacy in contravention to the U.S. Constitution. Then West Point graduates like Robert E. Lee resigned their commissions, abrogating an oath sworn to God to defend the United States. During the bloodiest war in American history, Lee and his comrades killed more U.S. Army soldiers than any other enemy ever. And they did it for the worst reason possible, to create a nation dedicated to exploit enslaved men, women, and children forever. As a retired U.S. Army officer and as a historian, I consider the issue simple. My former hero, Robert E. Lee, committed treason to preserve slavery. After the Civil War, Former Confederates, their children, and their grandchildren created a series of myths and lies to hide that essential truth and sustain a racial hierarchy dedicated to white political power reinforced by violence. But for decades, I believe the Confederates and Lee were romantic warriors for a doomed but noble cause. As a soldier, a scholar, and a Southerner, I believe that American history demands, at least for me, a reckoning. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I left a little bit out of the inter- of your introduction because I want to start with my that is my first question. You talk in the introduction to your book about a five minute video, five minutes you did in 2015 on the question, was the Civil War about slavery? It was published by PragerU, a conservative website specializing in short videos. And you point out that uh, your conclusion that slavery was by far the most important cause of the Civil War was not original with you and that almost all American historians would agree. And so I'm guessing that you didn't expect much reaction to that five minute video, but you were wrong. Can you talk to us about that? (laughs) I was so wrong. I mean, goodness gracious, Don, was I wrong. So I I, I did that video when I was uh, uh, flogging uh, one one of my books, a West Point, one of our books, West Point History of the Civil War. And uh, Simon Schuster was a publisher and they said, hey, why don't you do this publicist did? I said, well, do I have you know, academic freedom to say what I want to. And they said, sure. And I got permission, Uh, but I did it in my blue uniform, but I also did it in early 2015, but it came out after they did the whiz bang graphics, a couple of about a month after the white supremacist um, slaughtered nine churchgoers in Charleston. And it went viral. Um, It went by, it's it's had 35 million views. Um, And it turns out that the army does not like having its officers go viral. And what I said was that the citizens of the, uh, the, the white citizens of the South 
we're unwilling, uh, we're, we're, we're willing to fight and die to preserve the morally repugnant institution of slavery. And I got death threats. Uh, the Nation, which is a left-leaning organi- uh, a magazine, said I was a propagandist for the Army. Stars and Stripes, sort of on the center right, said that I was a, a, a shill for, um, uh, for, a prop- for, for a right-wing propagandist. And the Army investigated me for political speech. <laughs> so I got it from all sides. Uh, but I'm glad. But I think it also provided a way for somebody who, with a different authority, not some liberal college professor, but an army officer, to say what was the academic consensus. But yeah, it got me in trouble, and I still get hate mail about that video seven years later. Uh, you say early in the book, and you, you just repeated it there. I, I grew up believing a series of lies, and then you also say every place in my life reinforced the myths of the Civil War. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think, you know, if you think about what the, I can tell what the lies were and then maybe say what the, where I got it from, but the lies are the, it's called, the, it's the lost cause of the Confederacy myth. And that's what was, you know, totally, in my, I, I was like a fish in water. I didn't even know that there was water around me. But those <laughs> lies are, are this, one, that the war wasn't fought over slavery. Well, that's just absolutely not true. You can read the secession documents from, from Arkansas or from, uh, or their secession convention, sometimes they don't have it in there, but they have it in the convention that says Africa, we're fighting this for African slavery. We're fighting this because this is the labor system that's best in the world. Or you can read the cornerstone speech from Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, who said, quote, Negro slavery is the cornerstone of our foundation. And it's to say that the, the black, black men, black people are inferior and meant only as a laboring class. And that's the way God intended it. Um, Or another, so that's one, that that the war wasn't about slavery, not true. Another was that slavery was the best labor system. And in fact, slaves were happy and hardworking. And that was put in many of the the textbooks that I had as a kid that the state of Virginia gave me. Of course, that's a monstrous lie. Slavery featured legal rape. It featured selling families apart for profit, breaking up marriages, breaking mother from child. Um, It's as as evil a system as has ever been invented. Uh, And in fact, you know, they lived on enslaved labor farms, plantations that grew two crops cotton or tobacco or rice or, or sugar. And the other crop was humans because there was they got more money, the more humans that they bred. Another part of that myth was that the U.S. won only because of more uh, material and manpower. Well, no, all the South had to do, white South, remember the white is often silent. All the white South had to do was not lose. Another one part of that was that Reconstruction was an evil failure. No, Reconstruction at that period from 1865 to 1877, was our best chance at biracial democracy. And it, it featured 2,000 Black men who held elected office. My, many, when I was growing up, it was like, oh, Black people weren't ready for the vote. That's just not true. And at the top of this lost cause myth is the marble man. Every religion needs its saint, and the saint of this religion was Robert E. Lee. So that was the lie I grew up with. And I mean, if you want to, you can talk about how that came, but it came in the books in the, the textbooks, in the schools, in every aspect of my life, uh, I got that uh, that culture that Lee was the greatest human who ever lived. On a scale of one to 10, I would have put Lee at 11. It was a reverential treatment. <laughs> and, uh, and, and even though I'm a good Episcopalian, uh, as a head acolyte, Jesus would have come in about five or six. So <laughs> it, was, it was a reverential treatment for Robert E. Lee when I was growing up in Virginia and Georgia too. Uh, yeah, talk a little bit about your your personal background and the places you you grew up and 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 how those places contribute to the the, the reinforcing of this myth. And I, I should add, you say in here that uh, this is not something you just had as a boy. You, you continued to believe this well into adulthood. And we're I going to did. Talk about I, your aha minute in a moment, but go ahead and talk about your the places you grew up. Yeah, so I was born in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, people would say now, well, my goodness, that's just a suburb of D.C. And, and yes, it was. And no, it wasn't. It was an outpost. It was the last outpost of the segregationists. Remember, I was born in Virginia. Um, 1962 is when I was born. And, and the South and Virginia was a racial police state. It was an apartheid state. So um, uh, my dad had four pictures of the, the four Confederate flags over the mantle. Um, my first chapter book was Meet Robert E. Lee. Uh, the textbook I had in the seventh grade uh, said that slavery was good and the best thing. That was the Virginia textbooks on the history of Virginia. Um, Alexandria, that where I lived, was actually part of the District of Columbia until 1847 when it retroceded. And why did it retrocede? It retroceded, um, uh, went back to Virginia to protect the slave trade. And Virginia, uh, Alexandria spent only six or seven hours in the Confederacy before it was occupied by the U.S. Army. And yet, 
today, there are more streets in Alexandria named after Confederates than any other city in the South. And they were named in the 1950s and 60s as a reaction to integration. And I, I moved from Alexandria. My dad was a, was a coach and teacher there and then became a headmaster of a segregation academy, um, and which sprouted up like mushrooms in, in the South in 1969 when integration was enforced. And uh, the only purpose of that school was to ensure white kids didn't go to school with black kids. I didn't know till an adult that Monroe was the site of the last mass lynching in American history. So, yeah, and then, so my entire, until I was 18, uh, and, and I went, went back to school, where would I go back to school to be a Southern gentleman? I went to Washington and Lee University, my choice to be that gentleman. So um, certainly every part about that, my life led me to this sort of conclusion about, about Lee and about the Confederacy and about the white South, um, that the Confederacy was doomed but noble. And all the books, all the movies, um, Gone with the Wind was, was my first adult book that I read. So yeah, every part of those parts of my life uh, led me to that conclusion, which of course was absolutely wrong. Um, you, you talk about uh, uh, Gettysburg. I, I think if a person knows one battle in the Civil War, they know Gettysburg, or they think they know Gettysburg. Right. And yet right. you say Gettysburg heads the list of, of counterfactual history that, that's uh, at the heart of a lot of this lost cause mythology. Can you talk about that a minute? Yeah. Well, there are a couple of things about Gettysburg that, uh, that I think about. The, uh, the first is uh, after the war, um, James Longstreet becomes the goat, not the greatest of all time, the actual like the goat, like the, <laughs> the problem. You know, Lee is the one who orders that suicidal charge, uh, a Pickett's charge, which was named after a Virginian. And George Pickett hit during the battle. Every one of his his brigade commanders were, were injured. It could have been after any of those. But Virginians were controlling the narrative then, particularly by a guy named Jubal Early. Um, and so they blamed it on Longstreet, even though Longstreet begged Lee not to do Pickett's charge and begged him not to do day two, but to, to go around and get between George Meade and Washington. And yet they blamed it on Longstreet, even though it wasn't true. And why did they blame it on Longstreet? Because after the war, Longstreet becomes a Republican. He's a friend of Grant. He fights for biracial democracy in New Orleans, which is why to this day, the first, Longstreet, one of the great commanders in, the, in, in gray, there's only two statues of him to this day, one that went up in Gainesville, Georgia in the 1980s, and one that went up at Gettysburg in the 1990s. Why? Because he was he was banished from memory because he didn't support white supremacy after the war. So that's the first thing. The second thing to remember about Gettysburg is that when I was growing up, it was like Lee was this great gentleman because he he took he took credit for the defeat. Oh, it's all my fault. It's all my fault. Well, heck, yes, it's your fault. But as though that's like a, but the leading the death of, of tens of thousands of men the, the, and, and just a, a complete rout uh, of the Confederacy somehow makes him a gentleman. No, you know, it's to put a big L on his forehead. That was absolutely a, dis, a, 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 a devastating defeat. And if that had happened to somebody on the Union, on the U.S. side, I, I don't like to say Union side. It's the United States Army wearing the same blue uniform that I wore for years, the same blue uniform that George Washington picked for that army. So yeah, Gettysburg, and, and the other thing about it, when you go to these Civil War battles, as I took cadets there for years, we would often do just the X's and O's of military history. You know, th this side did this, and this side did this, and, and turning it into almost a game, rather than saying, what was this cruel war fought over? So every time I go there now, remember why they were fighting. Remember that Lee went into Gettysburg and captured, every part of his army captured free black people and brought them back for sale into Virginia, kidnapped them to bring them back. Remember that Lee's army's logistics was made up of enslaved people. This was a slaving army that that took misery and horror wherever they went. Uh, you talk about how Virginia and Virginians take control of the narrative, and I, I, it came as news to me, and I think this is correct, that there were more North Carolinians in Pickett's Charge than there were Virginians. And yet uh, we think of that, and that's, that's passed on in the movie Gettysburg, uh, uh, well, it's, 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 it's Virginia seem to be the only ones there. Uh, I had a good friend who's a, also an historian, and he said he, he never wanted to read another biography of a Confederate general written by a Virginian. Uh, but uh, how much of, 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 of the opprobrium that attaches to Longstreet deals not only with his post-war career, but the fact that he told Lee that he was right and Lee was wrong, in essence, at Gettysburg. Uh, and of course, Lee called him his old war horse. He Lee counted on him heavily, 
Uh, and yet yeah. he's he's very little remembered, particularly in, in, in Confederate memory and not uh, right. not, not not heralded at all. Uh, uh, going back to Alexandria for a minute, you, you, you talk about in later years, you, your hero came not to be any Confederate, but someone named Samuel Tucker. And I, I dare say very few people read that will know who Samuel Tucker was. I certainly didn't. You talk about Samuel Tucker a minute. Yeah, my hero. So, you know, one of the things I don't want less history. I don't want to change history. I want more history. And I, I Lee was my hero. I was wrong to have Lee as my hero. Samuel Tucker, uh, as he said, was born in 1913. And he said bootlegged in education. He had to go 22 blocks to take a streetcar. He's from Alexandria, Virginia, to take a streetcar to get to uh, a high school. From after high school, he went to Howard University, graduated, wanted to join, wanted to become a lawyer, and uh, there was no law school that would accept him. So he just studied the bar, and by 22 was at, maybe 21 was actually a practicing lawyer. Then in 1939, he led the first sit-in in American history at the Alexandria City Public Library. I knew nothing about this growing up. Then during World War II, he became an officer, rising to major in the 92nd Infantry Division, fighting. In Germany, fighting in Italy up against both the Nazis and against the American army, which treated that division just miserably, the segregated, prejudiced nature of the U.S. Army during that time. After that, he came back to Alexandria and then eventually to Southern Virginia, where he formed a law firm with Oliver W. Hill, which uh, cre- which led in 150 different civil rights cases. One of which uh, was the one that went to Brown was one of the ones that went to Brown versus the board. Reopened the Charlottesville school system after segregation is closed. It there, I mean, an absolute hero. And what I love today about Alexandria is when I was there in Alexandria, in the fifth grade, I went to Douglas MacArthur Elementary School, the segregated all-white school. And I was bused across town when we desegregated to the segregated all-white, to the segregated all-black school. What was the name of the segregated black school I went to in sixth grade? Robert E. Lee Elementary School. The other segregated black school, Stonewall Jackson, (laughs) named in, I know you can't make it up, named in 1961 as a reaction to integration. Remember that when you see a Confederate monument, it's either put up like 1890 to 1920 or about that period, which is to say the whites are back in the saddle. We now control everything. Uh, we've redone our constitutions. We've excluded black people and we're in charge. And they're in front of the courthouse to say white supremacy now and forever. If they're after World War II, they're often a reaction to integration. But now in Alexandria, they closed Robert E. Lee Elementary School and Samuel W. Tucker Elementary School is there in his place. And I think that is a sign of the hope that if we get our history right, we become an empathetic, we become better citizens, we become better people. I thought you made a very interesting point about uh, the words we use to describe things are very important. You don't like the term Union Army, you like United States Army. Uh, also about the name of the war. Uh, any historian knows if he does research, he does research in something called the, the, the War of the Rebellion, the records of the War of the Rebellion, which apparently was what it was called generally in the years after the war. Uh, talk about the evolution of that name. Yes, well, the, the, the name has been called many things. So when, the, when the White South uh, first started fighting, they called it the War for Southern Independence. And of course, that didn't last. Um, uh, initially, some of the people in the, in, the, um, in the United States called it the War for Union. Uh, but eventually, the United States called it the War of the Rebellion. And that's the 127 volumes are there. The great monument at West Point that was put up in 1898 says the War of the Rebellion. And that's to make sure that we know that no one ever recognized the Confederacy. It was never recognized by any other place. It's only for four years. And it's a rebellion, which under the Constitution is illegal. And any government is going to put that down. It was revolution, except it wasn't. It was failed. A failed revolution is a rebellion. Um, But there are other names for it. Uh, uh, Frederick Douglass called it the Slaveholders Rebellion which I love. I think that's that's a, that's an amazing term. But the South had other names for it. The white South had other names for it too. Um, in, the, in the late 1890s, they settled by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, Sons of Confederate Veterans, choose the war between the states. And Jefferson Davis in his turgid and endless 1300 page memoir <laughs> says that that it's a war, it's war between, this is like fighting Germany and France are fighting against one another. No, this is an insurrectionist power that would not accept the results of a democratic election. Another name that they called it uh, was the War of Northern Aggression. Well, that's hard to say when it's when it's the South that seized federal property throughout. It wasn't just Fort Sumter, but many before that, and then seized all of these very violently. 
So it, it's the South is the one that start that starts this war. And then probably my favorite, not my favorite, but but the, the most outrageous, I don't think the most outrageous, other than the war of northern aggression, is the late unpleasantness. Yes. <laughs> which which you hear, <laughs> which you hear occasionally. Wow, so it's the late unpleasant. I gotta be careful because when I go into my deep Southern accent. I sound sort of like Foghorn Leghorn, so I got to be careful. About, <laughs> I got to be careful about that. I've been in the army too long and lost most of my Southern accent. Well, you touched on my favorite cartoon character there. I did. I wasn't expecting that, but uh, <laughs> he's my maybe, favorite too. Part of the lost cause myth you saw, talk about is this notion that the South cause was doomed from the start. Really, that comes from Lee, doesn't it? In his, his farewell address to the troops, right? Written by his uh, adjutant uh, Charles Marshall, um, and you know this is saying. But it, what he's saying is that it was overwhelming force that did us in. We didn't have a chance from the start. Well, that's just baloney. You know, there are several turning points. If, if, if they had not won it on the battlefield, uh, the U.S. forces that I won on the battlefield could have lost then. Um, if, uh, uh, let's see, there are other ways that they could have lost. If it had been recognized by other countries, they could have lost. Up until 1864, up until Sherman taking Atlanta, we didn't know what the outcome of the 1864 election. If McClellan had been elected president in 1864, it easily could have gone the other way. So remember that the, the, the United States had to take had to had to uh, defeat multiple armies over an area the size bigger than the size of Western Europe, um, and it had to defeat multiple armies. It had to uh, it had to mobilize like no nation had ever mobilized before to defeat this force. So no, they did not have to win. But what Lee is saying in his farewell address. In General Orders number nine is saying that we the reason we lost this war is because of that, you know, it was overwhelming force because of the immigrants, because black people were fighting. Remember, almost 200,000 uh, black soldiers and sailors are fighting for the United States. Um, and, and, and slavery was tearing up um, the, 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 the Confederacy from the inside. So there are lots of reasons to this, but they're trying to keep their honor. How do you deal with such a catastrophic defeat? The White South uh, sowed the wind and reaped the whirlwind. Uh, you mentioned in your in your book uh, James McPherson's notion of contingency that there were at least four major times during the war where if things had gone a little differently, the outcome might have been very different. Uh, what I've always wondered about uh, in Lee's uh, last speech there, which becomes the basis of this lost cause mythology, why he didn't understand that in 1860 and 1861. I mean, he, he had been around. He, he, he knew that the material advantages of the North, the population advantages of the North, but it's like he has this epiphany in 1865 that this happens. Now, I've always wondered why he didn't understand that before the war. Maybe he did. Uh, I just thought he could do something about it. Um, another thing that struck me about your, your, your book, uh, the U.S. military has been applauded across the years, and I think in some cases rightly so, for sort of being in the forefront of uh, civil rights, of desegregation, desegregation. We talk about Harry Truman's desegregation of the military. But you point out there's another side to that that's not quite as, uh, as, uh, as happy, as, as, as uh, complimentary to the military. Yeah, it's absolutely true. I mean, in 1948, when when uh, Truman in 49, I can't remember which year, issues uh, Executive Order 9981 desegregating the military, the military, including Omar Bradley, who's chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, fights this. They don't do it immediately. Um, the two secretaries of the Army, both from North Carolina, the first two secretaries of the Army uh, are end up sort of getting forced out because they won't do it. Um, and it's only the contingencies of the Korean War, which really forces the Army uh, to begin desegregating. The Air Force does it best. Part of the reason is they have a very high ranking black officer, Benjamin O. Davis Jr., leader of the Red Tails of Tuskegee Airmen and a West Point grad uh, who helps the Air Force do it. But the Army, Navy and Marines are very slow to do this. In fact, my father-in-law uh, graduated from West Point in 1953 and his, his, he had, uh, there were three black cadets in his company uh, there and all in his company. And it, so they didn't desegregate the barracks until 1954. And even then at West Point is tokenism, just a handful of black cadets in every class until the class of 1973, until 1969, after MLK is assassinated, does that really start? So and still the number of senior ranking black officers is very, very low. So, no, the, the, the army does not do a good job. And it's not until the 1970s, the early 70s really when the army is starting the volunteer army, where there's a recognition throughout the Department of Defense that there's a problem with systemic racism 
within the military. And, and if, because they're race riots, they're, they're just huge problems with this. So they recognize it and they put in systemic solutions. So to this day, there is a defense race relations training institute now called Equal Opportunity. Um, there is an equal opportunity officer, a non-commissioned officer in every major unit uh, down to battalion level in, in, every, in every part of the military. So we knew we had a problem, but it took until the early 70s before that problem was fixed. And it's still not completely fixed, particularly when we talk about the number of high ranking officers of color in the military. You also talk, and you've been intimately involved with the, the uh, renaming of bases that were named for Confederate generals. And, and, and it's always struck me, some of them named for some really bad Confederate generals, uh, Leonidas Polk, Braxton Bragg. Uh, and that's been a struggle, though. That hasn't come easy either, has it? No, and I think maybe we just say how bad a couple of these are. I mean, the, there's that old Leonidas Polk, who the, the, the fighting bishop, Founded Swanee, the University of South was where my dad went to. He founded that to make sure that people under that that Episcopalian clergy understood a defense of slavery. And there's that old saying among historians, I think it was Stephen Woodward, maybe who said it first, is that the worst cannon shot that the U.S. Army <laughs> ever fired in its life. You know where I'm going with this. Yes, the worst cannon shot ever fired in anger <laughs> uh, in any war was the one that killed Leonidas Polk, <laughs> because if he had lived longer, the Confederacy would have surrendered earlier. <laughs> so and others, I mean, not some, even the best general of the bunch, uh, John Brown Gordon, who was it was a good general, fought, shot five times the Battle of Antietam after the war, gives a talk to black Charlestonians where he says, hey, if you the four million of you black people demand equality, the 40 million of us white people will exterminate you in a race war. And he founded the KKK in Georgia and was a white supremacist his whole life. Um, uh, several of them, like Brown and Benning, never served in the U.S. Army. We named these after the enemy. So think about that. We have been named after people that killed U.S. Army soldiers. I, I think it's outrageous. Beauregard, um, who is a camp name for him in Mississippi, I mean, in Louisiana, sorry, um, was, uh, was, uh, um, was fired after five days of superintendent of West Point for sedition. And we know that he raped enslaved women. So, yeah, these are terrible people. Um, that we named these after. And the reason behind that was? Well, the reason behind it is, is that we named them in World War I and World War II. This, again, this isn't something that came about in the 1870s. It came about, and it wasn't reconciliation. Remember, the United States generously granted um, uh, amnesty to all serving Confederates, including Robert E. Lee, amnesty for treason in 1868. And by 1870s, all the states were readmitted to the Union. So, it, so in fact, there was already been reconciliation. But there's this notion after 1900 that there's a need for reconciliation. But it's a reconciliation between white people because the boot has been put on Black America. Um, the, the Southern states redo their constitution to exclude Blacks from the uh, from the from they disenfranchise them. Um, they make sure that the only way that a black person can go in the courthouse is either as a custodian or as a janitor. Um, and then uh, lynching, uh, which kills 5,000 black men, women and children uh, up until 1950, is there to enforce that um, enforce that 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 legal terror. And so these are named in World War One. And by that time, the South is a one party racial police state, Democrats in charge. And they are uh, control all of the major um, uh, committees in the House. So part of it is that the Army wants to make sure that they are appeasing them. Part of it is the Army itself is a white supremacist organization. So they're named in World War I and World War II. And let me just give you a quote from Pershing. So Pershing says, this is, this is John J. Pershing, who commanded the American forces in Europe in World War I. Quote, we, uh, this is talking about black troops. We must not eat with them, must not shake hands with them, seek to talk to them or meet with them outside of requirements of military service. So some of them are World War I, then another group is in World War II. And so I was trying to figure out why would you do this? And then I, I, I read in the uh, Army Historical Education Center, I mean, I went back to the archives and that's really, uh, really changed me. But part of it, they said, so here's Army planners in 1932, quote, the Negro is lower on the scale of evolutionary development than the white. This is just pure racism. And so that is partly goes into that. Black people did protest this, but they had no vote. So in World War I and World War II, when the army is a white supremacist segregationist force, that's when these were named. You talk in your, uh, in your, your book about uh, Douglas Southoff Raven, the, the, the dean of, of modern Lee scholars, multi-volume biography of Lee. Uh, 
you might say hagiography hey, more than, than, than history. Uh, but in talking about Lee's decision, he, he said, I'm quoting here, Lee had no choice except to go with the Confederacy. Uh, Shelby Foote in the Ken Burns documentary essentially said the same thing. You say not, not so fast. No, I say baloney. That's what I say to that. No, not true. So I, I say that he chose treason. And let me give you a couple of the arguments for that. Um, first, uh, and I think most tellingly, um, in 1861, by I think June of 1861, there are eight U.S. Army colonels from Virginia uh, by, by then, and uh, all West Pointers, uh, and seven of them remain loyal to the United States. Eight, eight, seven remain loyal. Lee and only Lee chose, chose treason. Um, his, many of his family members stayed, and his sister stayed loyal. Uh, many of his cousins, his best friends, stayed loyal to the United States. And 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 if you talk about all senior uh, officers in the United States Army that were from slave states, twelve of fifteen remained loyal. So senior officers like Winfield Scott, like like Farragut, um, many of these people stayed loyal. George Thomas is another one of those famous ones. So they stayed loyal. So why did he, and many of his family? In fact, his daughter writes that she was surprised that, that Lee, when he's telling his family, says, "You will be surprised by my decision." So, um, uh, it, so it, it really, he did not have to do this. And in fact, for three days, um, when he when he submits his resignation, he immediately goes down, and accepts a commission in the Virginia militia. And so, for three or four days, he's getting paid by both sides. Uh, <laughs> that is not someone who you know who who did that. So, why did he do that? Why did he choose treason? And the other reason I say treason is there's only one crime in the Constitution, and that is Article Three, Section Three, and it says that um, anyone levying war against the United States with two witnesses, anyone levying war against the United States is guilty of, is, is, uh, is, is, that is treason. And it's meant to limit it to only limit it to, to, to levying war, not, not just saying something. But did he levy war? Yes. Was he indicted for treason? Yes. Uh, was never convicted for a bunch of different reasons. He was never brought to trial. No one was. Uh, but, but he was granted amnesty uh, he, he, he submitted a pardon, which was never accepted, but he was granted amnesty along with everybody else on Christmas Day, 1868. So why did he do this? It's slavery. So in 1857, uh, Lee, Lee's father-in-law, that's Custis, George Washington's adopted grandson, dies. And Lee takes two and a half years of paid administrative leave, leaving his regiment in Texas and goes back to Arlington and runs these, these enslaved labor farms, these plantations. And as he's running those, he becomes a very cruel enslaver, whipping the enslaved, his, which his father-in-law never did, breaking families apart, break, taking mother and child away from each other. He, all families but one were done this. He keeps them as long as he possibly can under the, 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 uh, the, this will, uh, even though he says he won't. And, and so he, uh, the enslaved there at the, at the Arlington say that he's, he's what, a cruel person. And whenever there is a chance, there is a, a something between um, uh, between kindness or human decency and profit, he chooses profit. And then during the war, right after the Emancipation Proclamation, he writes that we must win this war now or we will lose our social system. He said, that's why he's fighting. And he says, if we don't lose it, then our, our, our families will be subject to pollution. This is fear of black male sexuality, which is ironic because it's white male sexuality. It's white male rape. That is really the, uh, the ubiquitous during this time, and then, uh, then as I said, he already captures black people. He doesn't uh, when he goes north, and then he d refuses to accept black prisoners of war, and and many of them are shot on sight or tortured, including their white officers. And then after the war, he testifies before Congress, saying, "What should we do with black people in the state of Virginia? If it was up to him, he would kick all of them out. Ethnic cleansing." So he was never apologetic for this war, but I think. And so really, he chose treason. Other people did not. He did it because of his undying belief in the social system in slavery. You talk about Gone with the Wind and you talk about the Song of the South and uh, like a little lightning round here, if you would, just a couple of other okay. more contemporary things. Uh, the Ken Burns documentary, the Civil War, your feelings on that? Way too much Shelby Foote. <laughs> Way too much Shelby Foot, and I understand he's got the greatest accent in the world. He tells a great story, but but he, you know, the idea that the North, while the North would have, you know, could have won, won this wall with one hand tied behind their back, 
That's just cockamamie. It's not true. And, and, and you know, his, his love affair with Nathan Bedford Forrest. Oh, gosh, that just makes it makes me gag that the you know, this the, the person who was an enslaver, uh, the la- one of the last people who was taking enslaved from Africa and selling them the massacre of Fort Pillow, KKK. So I, I think if it was redone now, it would be done in a much different way. And other voices would have that. I, on the other hand, I mean, it did interest people in the Civil War greatly, mm-hmm. but it also mm-hmm. shows you how much we have gone. We've come to look at d- this from a different lens um, and look at it from the life of the enslaved to look at the purpose of this war. We can never forget what this cruel war was for. And it was white Southerners going to war to protect and expand slavery. So I think that would be, you know, the the romanticism and the sentimentality of it is is a little bit cloying to us now. But on the other hand, you know, it was something that brought this to life. Now, if you want to know great movies, Glory is, you know, one of my favorites. It's an amazing movie. Amazing movie. I'm I'm going to, we're showing it to my class on uh, uh, Monday. it's it's still as some somewhat from the white point of view from uh, from uh, Shaw's point of view, but still, I mean, a, a, an amazing movie, and it really rescued in a way um, the the black experience, the hundred eighty thousand U.S. Army soldiers. That, as Frederick Douglass says, once you put eagles on their buttons, they're going to be citizens. So I think that is a is a crucial step that we have come to to rescue that story. You know, I think it was Gore Vidal that once said, "The person that screens the history." makes the history. Mm-hmm. And so for, frankly, thank goodness, it's no longer birth of a nation and gone with the wind that is controlling our narrative. But things like Free State of Jones or um, or the Ken Burns or Glory or 12 Years a Slave, even Django and Chain, changing the way we view both the Civil War and slavery. Uh, Michael Sherrod's book, Killer Angels, on which the, the, the movie Gettysburg was based. What do you think? Oh, well, I tell you, we assigned that. I, I think we're reading it. I'm reading it again this semester. Um, we assigned it at West Point for years and years and years. I don't think that any book about the Civil War has had more effect than that one. There would not be a cheesy Longstreet statue at Gettysburg <laughs> if it wasn't for that. If you've seen that statue, and I recommend you look at it on Wikipedia, it's awful. Um, it looks more like the actor than it actually does the, um, <laughs> Longstreet. Um, but it has changed. way. It, it means that we now look at Joshua Chamberlain. I, my job for the first two years I was here at Hamilton, I was a Chamberlain fellow, Joshua Chamberlain. So it's it really rescued his story. It changed it. Nobody ever used to visit Little Round Top. So on many of those things, it's good. It rescued Longstreet. It changed the way we viewed Longstreet. So all of those things are good. Having said that, there is so very little about the purpose of this war. It written in 1973 or 74, there's nothing, very little. And then the one or two lines about it, you know, kind of get that wrong. So I think it is good for what it is, but it leaves out this 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 part about what this crew. I keep coming back to this. We can't let the the X's and O's. The 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 and, and it's fascinating the military history part of it. I, that's what I do. But we can't forget what this war was about. So talk about the, all the the enslaved people that were there caring for them that are that are that are there on the on the uh, and the captured people. That are there in Lee's army. So those are the things that we don't have. That I think, if it was redone, I, I, I recommend um, the march by E.L. Doctorow mm-hmm. about Sherman's march, which I think is just a fabulous fictionalized account. I wish that was more popular. Uh, gods and generals, the worst, the worst, <laughs> the worst of the worst. And I hope that no one. Have you ever sat through the entire? Oh movie? yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, not me. I tell you, when when Longstreet. Uh, I, I mean, sorry, when Jackson is dying, the 30 minutes of the Jackson dying <laughs> may be the most excruciating period in cinema, ta- cinema, cinema history. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't know if you've ever been to that battlefield, but, you know, Longstreet's yes. arm, if there's an arm stone there for Longstreet's arm. So this was like the shrine for Jackson for years. And if you want to see more shrine, go to the Manassas battlefield mm-hmm. and there you will see a steroidal Jackson. A jacked Jackson. Um, he, has, he, he he looks like he has been pumped more full of steroids than Arnold Schwarzenegger in his height. And poor little Sorrel, his horse, is even more roided out. So yeah, there's some <laughs> crazy monuments out there. And Gods and Generals feeds into all that. So yeah, terrible. Uh, and the movie is the worst movie uh, that I can think of. Yeah, uh, I save this for the end because I I want to give you some time to talk about it uh, before we go to questions. Uh, Constitution Day, September the 17th, 2017. Uh, Got to be one of the uh, great moments of your life, I would think. And 
one of the scariest, even for a man who's been in combat, I would think that would, I can't imagine how you must've felt going in there. Talk a little bit about the background you have with the institution of we, uh, Washington and Lee and in that, that day when you're, when you go yeah. back. So I, I am a graduate of Washington Lee University and my last time that I had been in Lee Chapel. And if you could imagine Lee Chapel, um, it is a chapel dedicated to Robert E. Lee. And there is an apse, and I was Episcopalian acolyte. So the apse of the Holy of Holies uh, and, and there on the Holy of Holies is a white altar. And on the white altar, is the is a statue a, a, a of Lee asleep on the battlefield in his Confederate uniform, grasping his sword, ready to fight in, in the whitest of marble, ready to fight for his people. So he is literally what is worshipped in that chapel. And the last time I was up there before this in 2017, uh, I was there to get my commission, raised my right hand, gave the oath of office. And many of you may have taken that oath of office or you know people that have served before that oath, which I didn't realize till much later, was actually an anti-Confederate oath written in 1862 when it says all enemies foreign and domestic, talking about Confederates. So after 35 years or 33 years, something like that, I'm invited back right after the Charlottesville uh, white supremacist violence. And my good friend, Ted Delaney, um, uh, a, a black um, scholar there, invited me back and to give the constitution speech. And I go and I talk about debate and I was nervous in the service. Absolutely. You have me right on. I was so nervous. Um, and I told my story first of growing up with, with, uh, with, with Lee idolatry. And I asked my school, you know, to, to change. But as I was doing that, I said that Lee violated article three, section three. I called Lee a traitor. I said, he did it for slavery. We're literally standing over his grave. His grave is a story below, but um, and, and at this 99% white audience packed in, in Lee Chapel, mm -hmm. calling Lee a traitor for slavery. But by telling my story first, uh, it had a reaction I could never have anticipated, which was they gave me a standing ovation, ovation yeah. for saying Lee was a traitor for slavery and telling and really telling my school to get after this lost cause myth and change itself. Uh, if it wanted to, it needed to, as I said, their lead follower, get the hell out of the way. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I am. I, I do have some pride with that, but I also uh, was it was great of the university to invite me back there because they knew they knew what was coming. I think they, they knew, knew what they were getting. Coming. They, yeah, knew they knew what they were getting. Uh, yeah, and that's available, by the way. If you want, if people want to watch that, you can Google that. I watched the whole thing. Were you surprised at the reaction? Did did, did you sense as you were making the speech how the audience was feeling about what you were saying? No, I did. I did not get that. I mean, I did. I did not. Because one of the, you know, no, I didn't think that was coming. Um, uh, it, it really shocked me. And it was a sustained ovation. It was uh, it was really something amazing to me to see my alma mater, which I had, you know, I, I, I had problems with because of my, you know, my own changing view of Lee uh, about what I, the way I would be uh, greeted there. So yeah, it was really amazing to me and, and incredibly heartening. And really, that's why I read the, I wrote the book, because that was called that speech was called Robert E. Lee and Me. And I realized that if I was honest about myself, that I grew up with these lies, that I'd be more likely to be able to change other people's minds. And because, you know, facts don't change people's minds, but storytelling does. And particularly if you can tell your own story as a part of it. And really, I'm doing the same thing that 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 women and black scholars have been doing for years, which is to use their own story to tell a larger story. So that really gave me the courage, along with my wife, uh, who's the one that told me I had to use, I had to be more honest. If I wanted to convince people, I had to tell them my own story first. And so uh, I grew up in a culture that did nothing but lie. And she is incapable of lying. <laughs> so she really <laughs> gave me both the, the idea to do it and then the courage to do it as well. Um, my wife had the same reaction that your wife did, I think, on the first time she ever went to the chapel there at, we, at Washington and Lee. Uh, and I think that's a reaction a lot of people have that are, that are uh, not acquainted with the, with the culture of the place. But uh, it seemed to me, Ty, in watching that speech in that setting, that the reaction was almost a, a pent-up reaction, that people were almost saying, Thank God someone came back here and said that it's been needed. Someone needed to say it for a long time. Did you get any sense of that? I did get that. I had a lot of people come up to me afterwards saying um, I felt that way or I grew up that way. And a lot of white people my age had the ability to do that. There were also a few black graduates in the audience who I've kept in touch with and, and given talks for them as well. 
and and it was it was a somebody it was there was release there. I think you're absolutely right. Um, there was a release that somebody had finally said what treason for slavery, and that's sort of my been my bumper sticker: treason for slavery, killing U.S. Army soldiers. It's not just that it was for slavery. It was if you love your country, and I love my country. See, I got my, the U.S. flag back there. I'm a patriot. I've served my country for 36 years in war and peace. I love my country. I hate people that killed U.S. Army soldiers. I hate people that tried to destroy the country I love so much for the most evil of purposes. So to to be a patriot, to love your country, I think is to love the United States. And 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 we must call out those those that fought for the wrong purpose. It, it, and if it was eight, you don't we don't own the actions of those who fought in the 1860s or even the 1930s. But we do have a responsibility to understand the facts, to tell the truth. And that's OK. You don't have to. We Americans are made out of cotton candy. You know, we can handle the facts. In fact, it made me a better scholar. It made me a better leader. Uh, it made me a better person. So uh, it, we all can learn about our own history. And I think and I think it, it is better. It, it makes us better citizens and it makes us a better country. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you uh, about what you talking here about your aha moment when your opinion about all this changed from what had been growing up as a boy and even as a young man. You speak briefly about that and then we'll get to some questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll try to do this briefly. So I was living, so I, I had already had a PhD in history and I knew the Civil War was about slavery and I taught that, but I could still somehow hold Lee in, in high regard. And there I was at West Point living on Lee Road by Lee Gate in Lee Housing Area by Lee Child Development Center. And I walked by our barracks and these barracks are you know, named after MacArthur, Washington, Eisenhower, Pershing, Grant, Sherman. And I got to Lee Barracks. And I said, huh, I wonder why that is. And I found like 10 or 15 things named after Lee. So there were three things that really changed me. Two happened slowly and one happened really fast. The two things that changed me, the first was, um, is I became an army officer. And the idea of being a, a Virginia gentleman receded in my in background because now I was an army officer. The second thing was I married a woman incapable of lying she changed me. She'd been working on me a long, long time. Uh, and then the third thing that changed me was going, was the archives, was the scholarship. And I went into the archives for trying to figure out this why this was. I thought, oh, it started in 1870. The bond of West Point brought them together. And I found out, no, they were banished in the 1870 from up until up until 1930s. Confederates were banished from West Point um, because they were traitors. So then when did it come? They came in the 18, 1930s, 1950s, 1970s. And why did they come? It was a reaction to integration. Bring black people, more black cadets, or integrate the army. And that's when these Confederate memorializations came. So it was this, it was the archives that was the last thing that changed me. And uh, and then you know the, the, then as I became more and more realized more about this in the archives as a scholar, then I became not just a historian about it, but using my own story, someone who wanted to change the way the army and West Point viewed Confederates. I'll take a couple of questions from our, our, our audience here. One of them says, how much hate mail do you still get from lost causes? Or do you still get hate mail from lost causes? Oh, my gosh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. In fact, I, did, <laughs> I had to take, my, I had to take my, uh, my phone number off the Hamilton uh, College website because I, I didn't know, but it, it turns out there's a five-minute limit on, uh, on the <laughs> messages coming in. <laughs> and uh, so this one guy called me up. I mean, I didn't answer the phone. Called, spoke for five minutes, got to the end of it, and then three more minutes came up again. <laughs> called right back and did it again. So on uh, social media, I get it all the time. Um, just two weeks ago, some uh, alt right uh, uh, website um, wrote uh, this long, horrible article about me, uh, particularly changing the Arlington Monument. Um, with, not changing, but getting rid of the Arlington Confederate Monument that has a ma quote mammy figure on it. So we recommended that, that get, we get rid of that. Uh, and so he had, he, he did this. And then he was on Steve Bannon's war room, um, where for eight minutes, he it, 17 times called me a scumbag weasel. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so yeah, they, they, they're on me all the time. I got the trolls on social media. So, but you know what? I like it because I know mm -hmm. that if those people um, that, 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 hate me i know that i'm saying my message often enough clearly enough um and and um and direct enough to really get under their skin so sometimes it's more important who doesn't like you than who likes you another question here says how do we how do you think we get other white southerners and whites in general to understand that the lost cause is a myth and it is not heritage yeah well i think the, the one of the ways that I do it is, first of all, I, I totally use the fact that I was in the army. I use the fact that I'm a scholar. I use the fact that I'm a southerner to say, listen, 
I love my country. I'm a patriot. Uh, I'm a veteran. And as such, I don't like people that choose treason. I don't like people that kill U.S. Army soldiers. I don't like people that abrogate their oath. I don't like people that fight for slavery. So uh, I think that it's going to take a while, but already, I mean, almost, this, let's just tell you, think about this. I wrote this book. I finished it in 20, or late 2019, came out in early 2021. Every, almost everything I wrote about by the, by the end of 2023 will have changed. Now, there's one monument in, in Monroe, Georgia that hasn't changed. The name of Washington Lee hasn't changed, but everything else will have gone. Everything I wrote about at West Point will be gone. Every, everything in the Department of Defense, gone. Alexandria, Virginia, gone. So it's amazing how many things have changed so quickly. I think, and I will tell you one other thing, this naming commission I was on, uh, which renamed everything in the Department of Defense, 1,111 things, by the way, there has not been one uh, state, local, or federal politician who has complained or said a word about this on either side of the aisle. So I just take that to say, we are getting better. I do have great hope for my country. And I think the lost cause is weaker now than it has ever been. And the, the, and the, you just can't stop this, this from getting out. You just read the secession documents in any class in America and you go, damn, really? They're that proud of fighting for slavery. So I do have great hope. But that's also why I keep saying this message over and over. I had a boss in the army who once said, Ty, he said, if, if you're not tired of hearing your message, you haven't said it enough. I don't ever get tired of saying it. And it, but my wife, who's downstairs, listens to these Zoom sometime. Um, and, and she's only a little bit tired. So so I'm going to keep saying it over and over. And I, and I hope that the person that asked that question will continue to do the same thing. Uh, a question I had in the responses you get, is, is, there, a, is there a generational divide? Is, are, the, yes, are the anti responses more an older generation or is that or not? I, I think mainly, yes. I think mainly they are older. There are a few that are younger, but I think mainly they are, they are older. And I think there are some that are trying to use this issue as, to exploit, to, to generate rage, um, like, like other things that have done, like CRT, which has, has been so successful to, to get outrage. What's amazing to me on this, on Confederate memorialization, is there have been people on the alt-right who have tried to make this a, uh, a, a, an issue and nobody's biting. So they just aren't biting about this. No one on the right or the left, even the, even the, the no one in Congress has complained about this, not one little bit. So I do think that this has changed in a way that I could never have foreseen um, in when I was, when I gave that speech at, at, uh, at WNL, uh, certainly the volume, I got the hate mail, but I get way more love on this than I get hate now. It used to be on the on that video in 2015, probably 50 to one negative. Now it's probably 20 to one positive. So I do mm. think that we Amer you know, to 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 misquote mm. Churchill, you know, you, you can you can count on the Americans to do the right thing after we've exhausted all of the <laughs> possibilities. So I do think we're getting better here. I have great hope for it. But I also know it takes citizens to to react and to realize every time they're in front of that Confederate monument in front of a courthouse, you should know that was put up there for a pernicious purpose to support white supremacy. It's, there's a reason it's in front of the courthouse and we should understand what those reasons are. Read the speech that was given and it will say Anglo-Saxon or something like that. I got a point of personal privilege here. You're a military historian. Uh, Robert E. Lee, the soldier. Did the myth of the lost cause exaggerate Lee's accomplishments as a soldier. How, how do you view Lee purely as a, from a military standpoint, as a military leader? All right. Well, first, anytime I do this, I first say, remember that he chose treason to preserve slavery and remember what this war was about. Now start there. The second thing was, is that we have to say that, that by taking over at the seven days battle and defeating McClellan when he was five miles from Richmond meant this war was going to last much longer. And in fact, ensured that was what really led um, Lincoln to do the, emancip the, excuse me, the Emancipation Proclamation. It was, it was the victory of Lee at the Seven Days Battle. He was an incredible, uh, an incredible um, a str strategist. So Alan Gelzo's new book, Lee A Life, I think does a great job in thinking about Lee as a strategist, which is he had to take the war to, um, to the United States because the longer it lasted, the worse that the Confederacy was going to get. Um, so I think that was good. Now, 
we got to remember, so he did well. In fact, there's no Confederate who was an independent commander who did even close to it. There's a reason why he's the myth of the lost cause. Everybody else is a complete failure. We often forget, I mean, we're in, you're talking in Arkansas. Remember, the, many historians will say now the war was lost in the West. And remember, there was not mm -hmm. one Confederate who had you know, very, maybe you say Chickamauga, but almost complete mm -hmm. defeat in the West over yeah. and over and over. So that there isn't any other victory except the, except in Virginia. And that was in 1862, um, really from the Seven Days Battle to Chancellorsville. But starting in July of 1863, it's all defeat. And remember, the finest soldier in this war, and I would argue the finest soldier ever to wear U.S. Army blue, is Ulysses S. Grant. And Grant understood war from from the from the political, the strategic, the operational, the tactic, and then could write a write like a bell. The, the problem with Lee is that he did not write clearly. He gave conflicting orders, and that often hurt him at the tactical and operational level. So I, I, he certainly created the Army of Northern Virginia. No one fought harder for a worse cause than did Lee. So yeah, I, I certainly think that we can we can talk about that as long as we. But it's the same. But remember, this is an evil army that is bringing enslavement wherever it goes. It is also on the backs of enslaved logistics as well. So in the same way that we look at the Wehrmacht during World War II and say occasionally how well they fought, we've got to remember that they fought evilly because of how they use other human beings. And the way that the Confederate Army used other human beings was immoral. Passage, Lee, we're delighted to have had you. It's a great, great session. If you haven't got this book already, please go out and, and get a copy, Worsworth Books. Uh, I think you, you won't regret it. Thank you again for being here. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone who tuned in. We hope you'll make other sessions either online or in person. Uh, if you enjoyed this program and would like to help support the Cows Festival programs, please make a generous donation today. You can snap a photo of the QR code on the slide and it should take you there or also you click on the link in the chart. And we'd love to hear what you thought about the program. It's easy to do. Just snap on the other QR code or go to the other link uh, and give us your opinion of tonight's program. And lastly, don't forget to vote for next year's Classics and Context at Cows Venues. You can do it online at sixbridgesbookfest.org uh, under the About Festival tab. And the classic is chosen based on your votes. So again, thank you to all of you. Thank you especially to Passigilly. We're, de we're delighted to have had you. Uh, and uh, we'll bid you all a good evening. Thank you, Cal. So thank you, John. Appreciate it.